let's get started. What is this about? Why from scratch? Then we're going to see what we want to do, what we want to have, what is going to work against us, <coughs> how we can overcome these constraints, and the details of what choices we're going to make, and eventually what would be nice to do in the future. A um, couple of years ago, there was a, a huge craze about drones uh, at uh, ELC. And uh, I was like, well, why don't I try it myself? Uh, nowadays, uh, it's so inexpensive to give it a shot that I didn't feel particularly bad uh, in case I would just buy a bunch of equipment and then give it up. But it didn't go like that. Uh, for me, it was also a sort of a, a challenge to myself uh, of, uh, OK, everyone seems to be able to do it with a huge uh, course on it. C can I do it starting from the other end? Um, back in the days when I started working, I used to work on uh, microcontrollers for uh, automotive dashboards. And there you had 8-bit uh, microcontrollers. So for me, the idea was, uh, can I try to reuse that, that experience and bring it to a drone? Um, other thing is, uh, uh, can I make a something which looks like a toy but can be a sort of educational tool for my children? Why not also for somebody else? In these cases, you don't want to give to a child something particularly expensive because you know it will break eventually. Um, why from scratch? Um, there are a bunch of reasons. Uh, one was, uh, well, it didn't seem fair <laughs> to reuse uh, uh, existing frameworks because uh, that would have not really been a full learning exercise, right? Uh, I have nothing against what is already available. And I'm sure it's far better than what I did. But for me, the idea was to really learn about the ropes about it. And second, uh, most of these frameworks, they tend to assume that you have a certain hardware configuration, uh, a certain minimum amount of resources, RAM, and, and so on, which was going against the grain of uh, the goal I set myself on. A and really, the idea was, uh, how much can I squeeze out of this uh, uh, really low-end hardware? <coughs> uh, I decided to start humble, so four-wheel drive drone. Uh, flying drones uh, are cool. Uh, the problem is that when you have a software crash, you can end up also with a hardware crash, physical crash. I wasn't ready for that yet, and still I'm <laughs> not. Uh, also, if you, like my main source of material is uh, eBay, and you find a bunch of things uh, about that. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, components or kits, uh, really cheap for, for making four-wheel drive drones. Um, I wanted to make it so that uh, it would be possible to plug in and out uh, new components, uh, experiments. So uh, that required also a uh, certain level of modularity. Um, which kind of goes fine with uh, low cost, because uh, usually what you find are uh, cheap components which do one single function, and that's OK. Uh, the main problem uh, with uh, flying drones is weight. You have to be very careful about uh, your payload. On car drones, uh, it goes a bit easier on you, because uh, well, you have a floor which supports it. So the only thing you have to care about is just to move the motors and inertia. And this modularity was also the idea that it would support uh, uh, ease of debug, like unit debug. Um, what I set myself as uh, requirements were to be able to control the speed, the steering, and uh, to have some means of controlling it remotely. Uh, obstacle detection, avoidance, uh, camera string were nice to have goals. and. Uh, for the sake of not disappointing anybody later on, I haven't managed to reach them yet. 
I have some uh, uh, work in progress on some of these items. Long term, uh, uh, remote computer vision, onboard computer vision, but these, uh, they kind of go against the fact that uh, uh, I'm really trying to keep the bill of material cheap. Um, since, as I said, this is a sort of hobby project, I didn't have much time to put in it. And uh, really, the idea was that uh, this would be a kind of, of a toy, and therefore I really wanted to keep it uh, low cost. Um, nor I wanted to start depending on uh, some custom-made uh, PCB. Uh, some of these uh, projects I've seen, uh, they do that, but and I have nothing against it. I mean, if you're making a real commercial product, uh, you want to leverage uh, all the weapons you have your, in your arsenal. But this was not the case. Uh, although I've seen that some uh, companies offer uh, uh, fairly inexpensive uh, uh, creation of PCBs, but that's still kind of one level of magnitude more complex than what I wanted to keep to. Um, well, this is just more uh, more details about uh, what I wanted to achieve with the system design. So, okay, one one more point is uh, power efficiency. It's true that this is a uh, uh, car, but still, uh, there are ways to waste power even there, and uh, I am going to try to explain uh, what is. Uh, best and what is not so good. Um, as I said, weight per se is not an issue because you don't have to keep it flying, but still you have inertia. So that affects the, uh, how different uh, or how complex is your steering model between uh, the ideal case where you just say turn and it turns and the real case where it can even skid. So there, there is also a goal to keep the mass low in this case, not so much for the weight, but for the inertia that it can uh, gather when it's moving. And then finally, um, sometimes uh, we make mistakes. Uh, you connect <laughs> wrong wire. So the idea was uh, avoid to fry the most expensive components. So try to have some sort of buffer in between uh, uh, the high power part and uh, the more expensive control logic. Um, this is a preliminary um, thought I had, uh, and uh, at least this is my are my conclusions. If you if you think otherwise, feel free to stop me, and uh, we can we can talk about it. But basically, this is a comparison uh, between uh, um, two main options that are available nowadays. Uh, you can uh, buy. Uh, basically single board computers which have a bunch of GPIO, a bunch of PWM, uh, ADC, uh, plus uh, kind of high-end logic. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can have uh, one such thing or similar, which is kind of the brain of your system, plus uh, uh, one or more microcontrollers which implement uh, some low-level functionality. Um, as you can see from the amount of green, uh, my conclusion was that uh, it's preferable to go down this path because uh, um, while it might be less convenient for uh, flying drones where, as I said, weight uh, is an issue, uh, here it's easier to compartmentalize functionality and debug it. Uh, also, sometimes you want to have, uh, if not real-time, close to real-time responsiveness. This is uh, easy to achieve uh, if you have uh, even an 8-bit microcontroller which is doing one or two functions only, possibly through uh, some I hardware IP block. Uh, if you start to put all the possible functionality on one single uh, PC-like uh, core, e even if it has multiple cores, you still have a problem that you have to guarantee a certain uh, uh, set of time constraints. What some more advanced uh, SOCs do is they have a sort of companion uh, core inside the SOC which to which they can offload this uh, some of this functionality. 
but then uh, the problem is uh, you end up uh, um, tying yourself to some sort of proprietary solution. Um, one example is the uh, Intel Edison. If you look at the specific schematics of uh, Intel Edison, uh, there's an additional Pentium core inside it, apart from the Atom core. And this uh, Pentium core is the one which uh, um, generates PWMs, controls, GPIOs. Uh, it acts, for example, as an um, interrupt controller. Um, but then you end up uh, having to develop for that. And uh, for example, in the new version of uh, uh, mobile platform, uh, this microcontroller has disappeared. So if you had put your time on that, you now have to start again from scratch. Uh, while if you select uh, your own microcontroller, you are uh, uh, the one who decides what stays and what goes. Um, some considerations, uh, again, like I do not have, uh, uh, I'm not going to claim that what I'm, I've decided to be good uh, is uh, one solution that fits everything, but it, used, it was okay for my needs. Uh, if you are trying to do something different, you might find that what I have done uh, is not appropriate or not uh, adequate for your needs. It's true. Um, Again, about the multi-board approach. Um, there are, for, for example, still about the uh, real-time responsiveness. Uh, there, are, there is a set of uh, patches uh, which make Linux become a real-time OS. Uh, they are from Thomas Glexner. Uh, and uh, over the years, and it's more like more than a de decade, uh, he has managed to massage most of them uh, into the Linux kernel. But still, there's a delta. So, if you want to turn uh, your uh, single core machine into a real time machine, uh, you have to, for example, start patching and uh, maintaining the kernel, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's additional work. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have uh, a set of microcontrollers, you can choose for each of them uh, the real time OS you want to run on them, and uh, there you go. Um, this is a very simplified view of the, of the system. Um, the backbone of it is the I square C bus. Uh, let me see. Okay, this is another option. So in option A, uh, there's a sort of main board uh, which uh, can be interacted with over Wi-Fi or some other radio, but it's a kind of high-end implementation. The other view is uh, uh, if I put just a simple microcontroller which acts as a bridge between a radio connection and uh, the other microcontrollers, and I have a transmitter, this is a sort of a, a remote control car variant, so there's, it's as dumb as it gets, almost. There's a bit of assistance in, in the uh, control of the motors, but this might also be a nice toy. Um, Yes, uh, one, one word about the power distribution and battery. So maybe some of you are already uh, familiar with it. I wasn't. Uh, I noticed that some, sometimes uh, when I was, uh, uh, giving full, I was giving command for full power, the system would just shut down. And this is the type of uh, uh, power distribution I was using. Uh, I had the DC motors uh, attached to a 9 volt uh, uh, voltage regulator and uh, the control logic attached to a 5 volt control regulator. And both the regulators were attached to the main battery. Um, it turns out that DC motors can uh, drain quite a bit of uh, current uh, when uh, they are accelerating, and the typical cases of acceleration are from uh, steel to full power, or even worse, uh, if you try to reverse the direction of the spinning. And uh, this was uh, causing a voltage drop across the battery. So 
um, in some cases that I found, uh, some people even go as far as uh, deploying two batteries, one for the logic and one for the uh, actuators. This is the safest way because uh, uh, you really cannot influence one with the other. Uh, the other alternative is uh, to limit the current that can go into the motor so that it never brings the battery to have a voltage drop. And this is the way it changed. So I replaced the normal uh, voltage regulator for the motor drivers with uh, uh, another one which can also limit the current. Uh, this way uh, it reduces a bit the maximum torque that the DC motor can provide, but on the other hand, uh, they wouldn't uh, uh, manage to do much because uh, eventually the battery would, would just not provide all the current that they try to draw. Um, now, I already mentioned that I'm using DC motors, but how did I come to this uh, uh, choice? Uh, mostly in this case, when you're driving wheels, uh, you have two options, and, and you can see them in uh, various type of uh, robots or cars that people uh, are playing with. Um, DC motors are fast, they are cheap, they are robust. Um, they're not precise, or rather they, they are in open loop, so when you give some command, uh, you don't know exactly what the output will be. Um, in other cases, for uh, low-speed robots, uh, something which uh, requires precision movement, uh, people use uh, servo motors. Um, if you know, the, for example, the Mindstorm kit from LEGO, they do have uh, uh, servo motors for, uh, for that. Uh, that allows the main brick to just issue a command or position command, and, and that's it. Uh, in real life, there are uh, various uh, issues with, with the servo motors if you try to use them uh, in uh, high speed cases. For example, uh, they can vibrate, they need to be modified, uh, and they are also going against the uh, constraint I set myself uh, to try to keep the bill of material uh, low. They are uh, indeed more expensive. So I went for uh, DC motors. This is an example of what you can find on eBay or Amazon. Um, what you can see is the DC motor here, it spins fast, and then here there's a gearbox which uh, reduces the overall speed of the, of the wheel. Um, the option I choose uh, has, on the other end, uh, optical encoder. It's basically, if you are familiar with uh, all the ball mice for computer, they had the same stuff. So the ball was making uh, two of those uh, rotate. Uh, the way they work is uh, you have a optical coupler, which is a LED and a phototransistor, and uh, the small windows that are in the optical encoder, they pass between the, uh, the pair. So sometimes the light can pass and sometimes it cannot. And this generates a train of uh, uh, square waves. And the frequency of the square wave is proportional to the rotation speed of the, of the optical encoder. So this allows us to measure the rotation speed by just counting the number of uh, uh, transitions that are happening on, on, the, on, the, op on the optical coupler. Um, this is an example of optical coupler that uh, I'm using. Um, they are quite common uh, in the wrapper up world uh, because uh, that's what they use uh, as uh, uh, end of uh, line. So when the uh, head of the 3D printer is, is moving, they need to detect uh, where it has reached the farthest position, and, and this is how they do it. Uh, the platform I chose, it even had the holes that were exactly shaped for this, so I suppose that's what was meant to be used. Um, you, 
you only need to basically uh, power it and uh, read the output. And to read the output, uh, the way I did it uh, is to put it on a GPIO configured as uh, input and uh, uh, count the number of interrupts I was getting on this GPIO. It's the safest way. Uh, sampling is not a good choice because uh, in order to sample, one should do constant reading at a frequency which is at least uh, twice the maximum frequency of the train uh, uh, of square waves in input. So that would waste uh, a lot of computational power just for reading mostly nothing. Uh, interrupts is the way to go because you get to handle only the real events when, uh, w when there's a transition. Um, this is how DC motors are driven. So what you see here is a H-bridge. And basically, the way it works is uh, um, opposite pairs of switches are closed to make the motor spin in either one direction or the other. So for example, S1 and uh, S4, if closed, uh, would make the current flow like this. And for example, make the motor spin clockwise while uh, Closing S3 and S2 would make the current flow like this and make the motor spin counterclockwise. Um, this comes in a nice package uh, like this. And uh, uh, this is where, for example, I found out the hard way, meaning that <laughs> first I tried the wrong one. Uh, there are uh, two major options. Nobody usually tells anything about it, but uh, the one on the left uh, is uh, such that uh, it can significantly affect uh, the power you can deliver to the motor. So the efficiency is not so high, and uh, you can end up losing 20, 30% of power on the motor's driver. Uh, one hint is uh, this one has a huge heat, heat sink attached. And that's because it needs to dissipate all that power that is not going to the motors. Uh, this one on the right instead uh, is much smaller, doesn't have a heat sink, and is way more efficient, and therefore it doesn't need to dissipate any heat. Uh, the price is uh, not that high, maybe it's like 50% more, but we are talking about a few dollars. Um, the way they work is the following. Um, you have two lines going to the motor driver. That's what we see here, these, these two. And uh, in input, you give uh, three commands, three lines. This PWM uh, in one and in two. Uh, there's written A and B because uh, each uh, of these can actually drive two motors. So each of these can drive two motors, and it means that you have uh, twice the amount of input and twice the amount of output. Um, basically, with two control lines, two binary control lines, you have four possible combinations. And these are uh, uh, make it rot rotate freely, uh, which is sometimes <coughs> useful. I haven't been able to figure out when I would like to use it, but it's there. Make it rotate clockwise and make it rotate counterclockwise. And the other way is to just lock the motor so it holds it in place. Uh, the PWM is there because uh, we haven't still uh, discussed about how to control the speed of the rotation. So the speed of the rotation, should have. speed of the rotation is done by generating a PWM signal with a variable duty cycle. And the DC motor acts as a low pass filter. So in practice, the DC motor is integrating the PWM signal that it receives and it is driven by the integral of this PWM signal. So if you go from a fully saturated PWM signal, uh, in this case, the PWM signal is uh, uh, controlled or 
has 256 uh, levels. It's 8 bits, so you can go from zero duty cycle to 100%. And uh, um, this is what I'm using to generate all of that and uh, read the interrupts. Uh, it's, if you are familiar with uh, Arduino Uno, this is just uh, a variant of it. Uh, it's much smaller. Uh, it's about this large. And uh, you can find it for about $2. Um, for each motor, what I can uh, do is uh, drive the status, meaning set it to spin clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, I have a hardware PWM generator, which uh, is used to control the speed. And uh, I can read uh, the output from the, uh, from the optical encoder, meaning that I can measure what is the actual speed, which means that I can have a fully closed loop. And it's kind of nice because this is done for each motor individually, so four times, two dollars. I wish this stuff was available 20 years ago. Um, they make nice toys nowadays. Uh, okay, this is uh, what I already said earlier. Um, one more thing that uh, I'm using is uh, a proximity sensor. So the proximity sensor, um, I haven't fully integrated it, but basically what it does uh, is a sort of a, uh, sonar. So you have to, it has two pins, you have to give a, a strobe on one pin. Uh, this strobe needs to be about uh, 10 milliseconds, and uh, that will cause the uh, sensor to generate a eight pulses. And uh, after that, it will start listening for the echoes. Uh, the output is uh, a gate signal on the echo line which has duration which is proportional to the time uh, from the last of the ping and the reception of the uh, echo. Uh, there's a maximum time after which uh, the echo is considered to be lost. Mm -hmm. But basically what you have to do is measure the time that goes between these two transitions. And that, that gives an idea of the uh, distance of the object that you have in front. I'm using eight proximity sensors. Uh, you might have seen some installations where there is one and it's mounted on uh, a motor so that basically the motor is made to make it swipe. Knight Rider like if you want. Um, that has a set of problems which are uh, first of all, stability. When you are moving, you cannot reliably detect echoes, so you have to wait a bit. So the, the, it's not a continuous wipe, but rather a set of movement. I don't know, I think uh, the typical stepping is maybe uh, five, 10 degrees. And then you have to wait for a little bit, and then uh, you have to generate the ping and listen to it. Uh, so that kills the idea of having uh, high resolution uh, uh, scanning because uh, if you are on board of uh, something which is moving, uh, it's difficult to keep the correlation between the movement of the eco and the movement of the vehicle. So the solution I choose is to have them fixed but to have many. Um, other problem is, uh, since these uh, devices, they are roughly identical, so they all work uh, on the same uh, frequencies, audio, in the same audio range, uh, you do not want to generate inf interferences, uh, meaning that if two are active simultaneously in the same direction, one might pick up the echo of uh, a 
obstacle detected by the other one. Uh, my solution is to drive them uh, from the opposite sides of the vehicle. So I marked here uh, in pairs uh, those that which can be active simultaneously. So for example, front left uh, and uh, uh, bottom right, because anyway, there's the current between. So I, I know that the vehicle should, shouldn't. There might be some triple reflection, but uh, that should be so attenuated that it shouldn't be noticeable. Um, what I have not tried yet is to see if I can use them uh, in double pairs. So for example, all those at the corners simultaneously, and then uh, the front, back, and the sides on another round. This would increase the, would double the time resolution. But that part I still need to try. Uh, now, coming to the microcontroller itself, uh, if you are familiar with Arduino, typically what you get uh, is that there's a main loop and uh, you can uh, configure some interrupts, um, but that's it. If you go for an 8 bit real time operating system, uh, you have much more available. Uh, you can have, again, interrupt handlers, but you can have also task scheduling. Uh, you can have uh, more complex uh, structures like uh, semaphores, mailboxes, uh, and that's what I decided to do. Other thing is, uh, um, at least at the time when I started looking into it, uh, Arduino was a bit of a problem because uh, it was usually, the libraries were usually written for uh, single case scenario, uh, example. There were libraries which would uh, detect uh, interrupts, but they might conflict in terms of what uh, uh, resources they were using with the library driving the uh, PWM. Um, because in general, people don't run multiple use cases on the same micro microcontroller. So in that sense, I had to rewrite uh, uh, a bit of the BSP that I was using. Uh, when I was looking for the real-time operating system, uh, I narrowed the option down to these two. Uh, FreeRTOS uh, is probably the, or oh, it, it's definitely the best known one because uh, it's available for a variety of uh, uh, devices from eight uh, 32-bit uh, microcontrollers. Um, the problem is that I couldn't find uh, a port for the specific microcontroller which I was using, which I found kind of strange, but maybe there isn't so much interest. There were a few people who had uh, done uh, their own port, but they were all uh, kind of old uh, attempts, and they didn't seem to be particularly successful. Also, um, another thing that I found was that many people who were using free RTOS were complaining about the memory footprint. I haven't verified it myself, but I found uh, quite a bit of uh, people saying that with a uh, few tasks, they had already run out of, uh, of memory. On the other hand, uh, the one I choose, uh, uh, ChibiOS, uh, has a much smaller footprint and uh, is, uh, it, it has uh, actively maintained the BSP for uh, the microcontroller I'm using. And therefore, I decided to go with that. Um, then comes the part about uh, uh, I2C development and, and debugging. Um, I will not say much about this because uh, I had a talk about uh, uh, how to create a I2C device uh, six months ago in uh, San Diego. Uh, I've put a link to it. Um, basically, what this is about is, uh, okay, I have... Uh, So if I have this sort of architecture, and this is the I2C bus, I need to have a way to create something, in this case, this uh, microcontroller slaves, which can be proper citizens on the bus. Um, 
why am I doing this is uh, uh, for doing this sort of activity, there are a certain number of uh, um, ready-made uh, boards uh, that can do motor control, for example, but they're not exactly matching my needs. Also, those boards, they tend to come with a limited amount of uh, addresses, while if I'm creating my own uh, uh, I2C slave, I can have as many as I want uh, of each type. Uh, usually, you do not get uh, many variants of uh, I2C slaves in terms of addresses, so it means that on the same bus, you can have only one or two, four at most in general. So uh, just as a quick summary, uh, the tools I've been using are uh, um, AVR Dragon, which is a tool made by Atmel. And uh, uh, not only it can be used to flash the microcontroller, but it also supports uh, hardware debugging, hard hardware stepping, which is uh, uh, kind of hard to do otherwise. Um, if you're not uh, familiar with it, the way it works is uh, through the hardware reset line, it implements a, a protocol for uh, AVR microcontrollers. And uh, every time you step through one instruction to the next, it rewrites uh, part of the memory so that it will stop at the next instruction. It's uh, quite aggressive on the memory consumption sorry, on the memory where, but it can make the difference when, when debugging because you do not have to rely anymore on a, a printf or equivalent. You can just see the content of uh, registers. Um, then uh, to analyze the bus protocol, basically to monitor uh, that the slave I was writing, that what the slave was writing would be as expected, I use the bus pilot. This is a, um, there are a couple of versions. The one I have is based on a FPGA, which uh, does a sampling of a bus and uh, it can uh, interpret uh, and decode uh, various protocols, uh, I2C, SPI. Uh, you can also use it to generate uh, messages on these buses themselves. Uh, then I use a, a cheap 8-bit logic analyzer plus Sigrock and Pulse View. This basically turns your PC into a digital scope. And uh, for the analog part, uh, I use the um, Huntex Scope plus uh, Open Huntex. Um, all of this uh, I'm talking about uh, is done with Linux, so you do not need to resort to Windows for, for this. Uh, One thing that I had not uh, accounted for, but uh, eventually turned out I had to do, was uh, develop my own uh, uh, high-level protocol debugger. Um, what you see here is just a screenshot of a tool I whipped together in uh, Python plus uh, TCK, which uh, uses the bus pirate to send and receive messages over the bus, but allows me to do high, to do control of high level functionalities like uh, um, calibrate, uh, um, set a certain wheel to a certain speed, uh, start it, stop it. Um, I just realized at some point that uh, it was not uh, feasible for me to enter manually all the low level commands which would uh, uh, yield uh, some high level functionality, so I had to basically put them together. Um, and now we come to the selection of the main board um, for the case which is not uh, just a remote control car. Uh, my conclusions are this, that this is what uh, uh, is needed. Of course, uh, Master and Linux is kind of my requirement, but I wanted to keep a development environment that I was familiar with. Um, low power consumption, uh, this is um, 
relative in the sense that most of the power goes anyway to the, to the motors. So it should be so that uh, the power consumption of uh, this board uh, is negligible compared to the motors for the duration of the operations. Uh, it needs to be at least uh, capable of uh, behaving as a master on the I2C bus. Uh, Wi-Fi mostly because uh, um, when I work with it, uh, I set my Android phone uh, in uh, access point mode and I make the uh, board pair with my phone. Uh, other types of radio would be equally fine. I just found out this to be easy because I can SSH directly into the device from my phone. A small form factor because well, the car itself is not that large. And uh, uh, USB on the go master, this is a requirement for uh, future uh, functionalities. Um, my intention is to not use uh, any, um, or uh, my intention is to use, for example, USB webcams for uh, uh, taking images. Um, at least for a monoscopic view, this should be sufficient. Uh, I do not know if it will be enough for a stereoscopic view, but I, that's what I'm planning to try. Uh, I put here uh, the option I contemplated. Um, this is a bit biased by the fact that working for Intel, I actually have access to uh, some of these boards at my office. Um, the one I've chosen, at least temporarily, is the first one, the Intel Edison. This is a bit old and is not that cheap. So it goes a, a bit against the grain of my initial uh, requirements, but it's the only one that I could uh, uh, get to work reliably. Um, what I'm planning to do next uh, is to use the chip. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It was presented uh, six months ago at uh, ELC. Uh, it's advertised at $9 computer, so it definitely fits the bill of uh, uh, being part of a low-cost uh, drone. Uh, the only problem is that it has been delayed, so I haven't been able to use one yet. <laughs> um, I hope it will arrive by the end of the month. And then finally, the Intel Joule. Um, actually, I do have one of these on my desk. The problem is, uh, first of all, it's more expensive than Edison because you are getting basically a, a real computer in it. So it might be interesting to use it for computer vision uh, tests, but not for what I'm trying right now. And furthermore, the board I have for it uh, requires 12 volts, so it's not compatible with what I have. Um, I've seen that there's a tool called uh, Geppetto, which uh, uh, is a sort of helper for generating PCBs, but even there the price goes high quite fast in the range of hundreds of dollars when one tries to get a board for this. So it's probably good for a high-end drone, but not for this one. Um, what I'm planning to do in the future is, is this. Um, I don't know exactly in which, uh, in which order. Uh, I guess the major change uh, is uh, eventually it should work also as a quadcopter. I just need to get the, uh, enough intelligence on board to, to be able to manage the stabilization. And that part I do not know if uh, I can still keep the price low, but it's, it's my next goal. Uh, is there any question about this presentation? Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>